Cairo, Seattle. It's time to get schooled with a professor, Sean Clayton. Welcome to Schooled with a Professor, and our topic today is it obviously should be is officiating. Mike Pereira is going to join us and give us an in-depth look of where we are at the mid-season point with officiating. Also go into some of the particulars. And the great part, he wrote the book after further review. And I think I highly advise you to read that, particularly if you are a fan of the NFL and you may be critical of some of the officiating. It just gives you the background of what has happened in officiating in so many years and understanding it's such a difficult job because of now where television is. Television is so good in being being able to give you shots that in some ways the officials can't see. And so what's happened now, it usually leads to two things. And I know uh, from my many years of talking to Mike when he was a supervisor of officials in the National Football League to where it is now, we're always at the midseason point and there's always a human cry for, why don't they have full-time officials? Well, the, the reason is, if you would do it, I think you would have a lessening of the quality of the officials. Because, you know, you have anywhere between, what, 130 and what will eventually be 150 officials that are going to be out there. And most of them, if not all of them, there's maybe a few that have full-time jobs. Well, I mean, they may take the tact. It's like, okay, you want me to do full-time officiating or have my current jobs? And they'll say no. And you now are trying to to replace maybe between 75 and 100 officials, and there's just not the talent to be able to do that around. I mean, because it would be too quick of a turnaround to bring them from the college ranks, the high school ranks, and you know, there's always going to be a learning curve, and understanding the pace of the game is so fast, so much faster now than even before that it's very difficult for a whole new group of officials to come in and immediately equal what's been out there for 10 to 15 years. And so you're kind of in that balancing act where it's like, okay, you'd like to you know, have some more full-time officials and you can do that, but you can't, it would take so many years to get it to the point where you can eventually have 130 to 150 guys that are going to be full-time officials that, and you don't necessarily improve the quality. I mean, these guys, you you know, get 16, oh, probably what, 20 games a year, 18 games a year, if you include the preseason and some of the postseason stuff. And so then what are you going to be doing the rest of the year? I mean, looking at tape and stuff. I mean, you don't have any off season to do it. So basically you have half a year where you're studying, but you don't have a chance to execute what you've uh, learned in the study of all this stuff. But still, it becomes more difficult and uh, it's a challenge to try to make sure that the right calls are made. And I think I support the current group of officials, because I think they're good. I think the challenge that's there, that there's so many different interpretations that cause them to even have to kind of think through all the judgments. I mean, I'll give you the example on the, like even on the Richard Sherman play, and we'll get a reaction from Mike Pereira and what he thinks, because, okay, first off, here's Richard Sherman coming unabated to the kicker and on Monday night, Buffalo Bills, Dan Carpenter. All right. So he doesn't hear a whistle. Kicker's still trying to kick. So now what's Richard Sherman try to do? He tries to touch the ball, which he did, and try to block the kick, which is exactly what he's trying to do. And not hearing a whistle, seeing that the kicker's still kicking, he's going for the ball. Yet there's now this national argument, and you know it's been endorsed by the National Football League, that there should have been a penalty when I think there shouldn't have been. But here's where the extra judgment's there. First, the official has to say, okay, did he touch the ball? Oh, okay. Got to look at that. And then, of course, did he not do it? And it's like, is there intent or anything like that? And so there's so many extra layers to just a simple decision where it's like, okay, you hit into the kicker, do you get a penalty or do you don't hit it, get a penalty? And that's where so many of these rules are. I mean, go back to the catch rule. I mean, you know, and that's where I think it gets confused because you put different interpretations at different times. This year is a little bit easier, but you had the 1.2 years ago where it was like, okay, you make a catch. And then of course you have to establish your feet in the sense that you're like a running back where you can make a run after the catch. And if you do that and you still hold the ball, well, it's okay. You got to catch. So now the official has to judge this, judge that, judge all these different things. And that's what makes it tough. You wish there's a way that you can make it simpler. And I think what happens from the league office is that you get wording that makes it more difficult to be able to do it. Plus you got to remember all this stuff. And again, it's all the, you know, game administration for a referee and an official. I mean, you can't screw up the rules. That's one thing that I think you know, they have to be the rules. But when you keep adding to and complicating the rules, it is that much more difficult. I still think these guys do a very good job. I think that uh, you know they're not going to be perfect. This game is so fast. And I can tell you now, I've now done four games from the sidelines uh, for ESPN Radio. Is And you look at it, and the game is so fast on the field, 
And it's like when you're watching on TV, you have the luxury of saying, what, did I see that right? And you replay it. You can slow it down. You can freeze frame it. They don't have that ability on the field to be able to do that. The officials just have to watch live, make quick decisions, and then hope and think that they're right, and then realize whatever call they're going to be made, they're up for immediate consternation, whether it's on social media or whether it's going to be even from the league office. Because now on big plays in big games, uh, Dean Blandino, the supervisor official, will give his review and his opinion, and within maybe minutes or half half hour of a decision that's being made. So it's a very difficult thing. But again, uh, officiating is a big topic. And of course, it's our topic tonight on Schooled with the Professor. And we'll get into that. We'll get into Mike Pereira's opinion. He wrote the book after further review. Coming up next is going to be Mike Pereira. We are always pleased to talk to Mike Pereira, who just finished up the book after further review. And before we get started, Mike, why don't you give us an update on how the book is going? Well, I don't know, because they don't tell you, at least I haven't been told, and they say that you won't get an accounting until like about six months or something like that. But I, I only know one thing. I've bought a lot of copies, so <laughs> at least I, I know some have been sold. Every time I call, I say, send me another 60, would you? And, um, you know, and I... And, and uh, and I either give them out to friends or or uh, you know use them at a speech I give. But you know I don't even mind giving them out, even though I have to buy them. I don't get them for free because you know I wanted the message to be that people could learn something by reading it. You know whether it was how rules get changed or an in-depth look at the officials themselves and their collective bargaining agreement, what they can do, what they can't do. Are they good? Are they bad? Um, I, I'm hopeful that people um, really do learn something. And so uh, I'm bound and determined to get them out into circulation, even if I end up giving them away. To well, do you, can so. put, you can put it on your Fox Sports uh, account, I mean, your expense account. I mean, you can try to do that. Uh, probably not. Oh, yeah. See, let's see. that. that I, I mean, they've already rejected my McDonald's lunches that I get down <laughs> in L.A., so I doubt they'll pay for my books. <laughs> the book is called uh, After Further Review, My Life, Including the Infamous Controversial and Unforgettable Calls that Changed the NFL. And, of course, Mike was a vice president in charge of officiating in the National Football League, the supervisor of officials for so many years, and kind of you know built the model of how this sport as an officiating group was able to try to translate from the old way, which is, of course, uh, you know not a, as much TV, into the new way, which is HD TV. And I know, as we've talked before, to me, it's – it's becoming so much more difficult for the officials with all the little addendums that are there, the judgment type of things. I mean, it's a tough job. And I, you know, and you know, I've always stood by the people who are officiating the games because I think it's a great group. Certainly there's going to be mistakes. It's human nature. The game is faster and all that. Where, where do you see right now the extra stuff on the officials that make it so tough to get, you know, put them in harm's way as far as criticism? Well, I, I don't I don't know that it's all that tougher. I mean, you know, what makes a game harder to officiate is the speed, you know, the speed of the players and the the uh, technique of some players and, and how they can, you know, mask things that they do and, and it's hard for the officials to see. Um, I, I really, though, don't think the rules have made it a lot um, more difficult than it's been in the past. I think the exposure... Has, uh, has has really made the difference. You know, you know, replay replay is a good thing. I mean, and and replay corrects um, errors that get made within the parameters of what is reviewable and what is not. But let's face it, replay has put more emphasis on the officials because if you without replay, you could have a a sideline catch and it looks like that the toes on the ground and maybe it's um, out of bounds and maybe it is just fractionally. Um, so you'd have it without replay. You'd look at it one time and you'd be on to the next play. Well, replay gets involved and now you've got three minute breaks where you're looking at every little angle and, and it exposes um, more of their mistakes. And, and, and I think that's okay. I mean, I remember when replay came back in, I said to the officials, if you're, if you're scared of replay, then get out and go find something else to do. If you can consider replay a challenge and try to keep up with technology, then, Stay involved and look at it that way. And um, so I, I just think that it's social media, technology, 
all of this stuff um, has made a difference because you can't, I mean, John, you can't get away with anything now. I mean, and, and that's not just people like me that are, you know, that are talking or the Gerald Austins or the guys in college football or other sports for that matter. The fact is, is that if you look at social media, I mean, you have, you have uh, Twitter addresses like zebra.com and all of these, you know, officiating sites that are looking for mistakes, quite frankly. And, you know, and then if there is a mistake that's made and maybe it's in a, in a game that is a, what we call a C game. So it's one of the lower games without a lot of cameras, you know, um, it's on social media. It's like immediately, you know, here's this play, you know, this call here, this call that was made, you know, was not a right call. And then, you know, once one person puts it on, my God, it just explodes. And, um, and, and so it's just different times right now. I, I don't think officiating's really any worse. I mean, I, I, I look at it and say, you know, I had the same complaints back in my day. Jerry Seaman before me had the same complaints in his day. But it's just, you know, it's two things. I mean, it's just more social media to, you know, to put more mistakes out there. And I think players are getting, you know, are making more comments than they made before with their dissatisfaction with, uh, you know, with officiating. So it's tough. It's always been tough. It's never going to be easy. And, um, you, you know, if you're official, you have to focus on the good things and uh, while the rest of us just focus on the negatives. And um, and that's just the way it is. And see, one of the concerns that I'm starting to have, and it goes into the social media and also how everything is so exposed with uh, HDTV and replay, is the fact that you know penalties, particularly a certain kind, are starting to increase. And if you start getting more penalties, that's not necessarily good for the game. So I'll give you a couple examples. 2011, including playoffs, there was 609 holding penalties. Uh, and now it's on pace this year for possibly 809. Defensive pass interference back in 2011 has been steadily increasing. from, And it almost is almost a 50% jump from like 210 to a possible 329. And as great as that is, it, and you're up to 16 penalties a game, there almost becomes too much. And as a su- supervisor official, how do you try to control that? Because stoppages of the game aren't necessarily great, even though you want to have perfect officiating. I mean, it's a great question, but, you know, I, I think there's one way to look at it and and, uh, and that there's too many penalties and too many stops. But then I also think you got to look at it in another way. Look at when I was in the office, and I know this hasn't changed, um, you know, you every week, every week, probably two thirds to three quarters of the teams would send in questions, um, call them complaints. I don't think you have to call them questions and there. And their questions were not often about what was called. It was about what was not called. And uh, this should have been holding, which was the number one category in terms of no calls. Um, And you gave them to the officials saying that you recognize it's hard, but this should have been called. This should have been called. This defensive pass interference should have been called. This illegal contact should have been called. (laughs) It came from either evaluating the game yourself as a supervisor or it came from the complaints that came in with the clubs but they were clear misses okay they were they were clear misses so if you look at the rise in the number of penalties um over the last few years and even this year i mean here's my concern if your penalty totals are up but you look at the penalties and their fouls and should have been called then what are we looking at here? I mean, are we possibly looking at the in the eyes of the clubs and the league that the officiating is getting better? I mean, I, I think that's realistic because you've been telling officials over the course of time, you got to get this, you got to get this, you got to get this. There are a ton of uncalled fouls, not a ton, but there are a few uncalled fouls in every game. And so, I mean, I'm thinking as the staff maybe matures a little bit um, because it is a pretty young staff. I mean, I'm thinking they're doing a better job and the teams are maybe doing a worse job. I mean, 
is the is the level of play sloppier this year, which, you know, when I watch it, I kind of think it is. And so I'm not going to blame, you know, the officials for the rise in the number of fouls. Um, um, I, I'm going to look at a, at a Raider game and, and see them get called for 23 penalties, and then you go through and you say they're all fouls. Well, what do you tell the officials? Don't call them? Now, that being said, maybe I think they've, overly tightened up a little bit in the celebration stuff um in the unsportsmanlike conduct stuff you know maybe so there but that's incremental in in terms of the increase in penalties so i I don't i don't have an answer but i would be i would be if i was head of the department i mean i think i would be dead wrong to say to the officials hey we got too many penalties don't call them uh, it's impossible to do that. So uh, glass half empty, glass half full, you know, certainly from my slant on things, I would I would look at it as glass half full and that they're actually doing a better job. Joined by Mike Pereira. Now, I guess looking local just to resolve the Richard Sherman incident, how do you view, should that have been a penalty or not a penalty for a personal foul going into Dan Carpenter? No, I don't think it should have been a penalty. I mean, listen, I was watching it in real time, and and I agree that it looked bad. Um, But, you know, the more I looked at the play and thought about the play and then went back and analyzed it further, I mean, I'd have to ask the question, what did Richard Sherman do wrong other than being offside? I mean, he was offside. He tries to jump the count, you know, frequently. And he was way offside, and it is right to be called unabated, but I have seen players, you know, get to the point where they're unabated and the play doesn't get shut down. And um, and so what is Richard to do? Call it on himself and, uh, and stop and let the ball be kicked? I mean, I, I, I look at this and say there's no whistle until after he made the contact because you know, it takes time. It's a it's a flash by the time he gets past the lineman and makes contact with Carpenter. So there's no whistle. I mean, he actually reaches in and touches the ball before he made the contact um, with Carpenter. And so, you know, what what could he possibly do? It's not like a you know, there's a similar situation where you know, a false start is called on the offense right about the time the ball is snapped and the defense, you know, continues on and hits the quarterback who's standing flat-footed. That's a different story. I mean, and I, I see that as a, as a dead ball foul. So the ball was snapped, the ball was placed, the ball was being kicked. And so um, I, I, I cannot put it into any category that, um, that he did anything wrong nor did the officials in that case do anything wrong as far as I'm concerned because the guy that's in charge of shutting it down is the guy that's all the way out at the sideline. He would be the headlinesman, and he reacts fairly quickly. But, you know, the fact that there was no whistle blown until after the, after the contact, the fact that the ball was placed down and kicked, um, I, I really absolved Richard Sherman of uh, – uh, of all guilt here. And, you know, to me, they, they overpounded it on TV by saying that it's roughing the kicker, which you can't have roughing the kicker because there was, there was no snap. And even if there was a snap, you wouldn't have roughing the kicker because Sherman touched the ball. So, you know, it's, it's all overblown. Did they mishandle the play clock in terms of, you know, getting the kicking ball placed down? Yeah, they did in that situation, but I mean, I, 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 I don't think if I was still in my job, I mean, I don't think I would even send it up for necessarily for review because I don't think there's a foul there. And I'm even more surprised that the, that the league in the third quarter, you know, tweeted out that it should have been unnecessary roughness. Um, and I can't get in their heads, but I think if they look back at that, I, I think they're going to say, you know, I, I don't think I'll do that again, but um, I'll go with Richard Sherman if he, if he gets fined. I mean, I, I'd go with him, and I bet you I could make a pretty strong appeal that he shouldn't get fined. You'd be, you would be a pretty good lawyer in that case. I think that would you'd be excellent in that. I got, I, this is the one thing I would be a good lawyer at. I mean, I, I think I could. I think I could. I think I could actually do it. Look, it's tough, and it looked bad, and Carpenter got hit. I get it. But there are, the, and the play turned out to be dead. Um, 
But again, you have to look and say some things are going to happen on the football field that, that just happen. And if it was a live ball situation, it wouldn't have been a foul. And there was no whistle that was blown before the contact was made. So, you know, again, I think that it's a shame that everybody was up in arms. And, and I'm unpopular because I'm taking this stance right now. But to me, this is what the facts dictate, that uh, that Sherman didn't do anything wrong. I mean, on, a, on the big picture, we hear this every year because you get into a season. It's a human game. There's going to be mistakes made and great calls made, not great calls made. And <clears throat> so the cry always comes down right around this time. It's like, why don't they have full-time officials in the NFL? And, of course, I think nobody can answer it better than you. Can you ever see that happening? And obviously, 117 guys, I mean, to change from part-time to full-time, you lose so many would take time. Why is there not full-time officiating? Well, I guess I would say, why should there be? I mean, you know, you're you're, you're running a, a dangerous pass pattern here if you're going to try to go full time with what is now I think on their current roster is, is like 130 and they're going to go to eight officials next year so you can add another 17 there um, so you're you're talking about almost 150 officials and and uh, you will lose a chunk if you go full time because these are in many cases you know successful career minded people that have made um you know, a name for themselves in other industries. And so um, I think you will lose them because they'd be loath to give up what they've worked to accomplish on their own personal side in business. Um, plus, I don't think it does any good. Look at the, the you know, full time, I, I get it. If there were games three times a week, you know, and, you know, and, and, and you could get more reps, you know, reps that, at practices nowadays with the restrictions on contact um, during the week and during the off season, it's not going to make you that much better. And, uh, and so I just don't see it, you know, baseball umpires are full-time basketball officials are full-time, you know, they get just as much criticism as the uh, NFL officials get when it's during their, during their season. So I I don't, I, I just don't, think the reason that I wouldn't be for it is I don't think it will improve things, you know, to that degree. Now, I will say this, John, um, and I've always been an advocate against full time. I do think it's time to take the next step, which to me, the logical step is to make the 17 referees full time. I mean, that is a legitimate step to me that it can improve more than just the actual calling of fouls to involve your 17 crew leaders um, who are in charge of instructing their crews on a weekly basis during the season. They conduct the meetings on Saturday. Um, They conduct conference calls during the week. Um, These 17, I think, should be full-time. They represent the image of the league when it comes to officiating. And yet you have a lot of differences on how they make announcements, um, you know, and how they project themselves. And to me, you know, these are the guys that ought to be full time. And when I'm saying full time, I'm not saying go back home and look at more video. I'm saying during the week you go to a central location somewhere like in Dallas and an officiating institute, if you want to call it that. They break down everything together from every game together. Um, they are the ones that talk about uh, proposing rule changes, mechanics changes, work with the competition committee, involved in everything. And I think you have a better chance then of getting uniformity with those 17, and, and you will get uh, consistent messages taken to their crews. Now, you run the same risk there. I mean, you might have you might have a few of the referees that say, you know what, I don't want to do it full time. And, and then I say to that, that's fine. Then you take those and and, uh, and put them back at their old position. But the league knows this. The league is trying to get this done on a full-time basis with at least selected officials. And they run into, you know, they run into opposition from the officials union, um, you know, because what guarantees um, are these full-time officials going to get? And I think, I think that's a legitimate question because if I'm a 
you know, a gene steratore, whatever, and, you know, um, what you're going to make me full time. So I give up my maintenance business and maybe even I give up my college basketball. Um, what happens if you're dissatisfied with my work after one season and then I'm not a referee anymore? You move me back to the side judge. Well, you know, I, I look at that and say to myself, yeah, you give your star players multi-year contracts, um, and, you know, and if you've got star officials that you're going to make your referees pay them and give them a guaranteed contract. So you say to them, you know, I gave you a five-year deal, and if we move you, to back to your side judge position because you're not performing well enough as a referee, you still remain full time, get the full time money, and uh, and uh, you won't get fired. So there's ways to get around it. But to me, if you're really interested in taking the next step, forget that they're going to bring in an eighth official next year. I don't think that's going to do any measurable good uh, as far as I'm concerned. But Taking the 17 leaders of the crews and making them full time and a part of everything is the next logical step to try to take officiating the whole realm of officiating to the next uh, to the next level. So now if you are a fan of officiating, definitely a fan of the NFL, or if you're critical of the officials, what you need to do is get the book is after further review, because what you can do is get educated into the history of what officiating has been. Mike Pereira wrote the book. It's on triumph books. And where else can you get that? I'm sure it's on Amazon, everything you can get. Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Um, those are the two main outlets and other bookstores too. It's really, it's really been, um, it's really been kind of fun. And just so you know, I have bought them from Amazon, Barnes and Nobles. I've, uh, I bought them from just about every outlet there is. Is that why you asked me for the loan the other day? Okay, never mind. That's, That's a different it. story. That's okay. It. You okay. Know, but your interest rate was just too damn high. Oh, so I'm a tough I, bargainer, I, I guess. I had to find another source. No doubt. Hey, well, the great source for officiating on you on Fox and this book after further review, Mike Pereira, thanks for joining us. You got it, John. That's it for this week's edition of Schooled. You can follow me on Twitter at Clayton ESPN and send me your NFL questions with hashtag Clayton Schooled for a chance to get your questions on the air and on the air.